By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back in Las Vegas, Nevada in the United States at the Sin City Open. This is match number three from that tournament and oh boy, this is going to be a fun one. We've got Chow who's playing Urnum Chaos. There are Urnums in there and a lot of chaos. And he's playing against Jason and Jason is playing Urnum Geddon. So both of these players love Urnum Jins but they're doing something completely different with it. So this is going to be an interesting matchup. Now this uh, tournament is played according to the eternal central rules. That means that Fallen Empire is allowed. You can play with up to four strip mines and mana burn is real. Now before I jump into the deck decks, because I've got lovely deck photos of both of the decks, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to first go to the games, maybe check out the deck decks later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find se several timestamps one of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and it'll take you straight to the game action. And here I'm going to continue with the deck deck section of the video. I'm going to start with the deck of Chow, Urnum Chaos. And here we see the deck of Chow, so it's called Urnum Chaos. And that probably refers to the fact that he's playing with four colors. So the only color that he hasn't included in here is black. Which is kind of funny because a lot of people splash black for the Mind Twist and the Demonic Tutor. It is not in here. Now when we're looking at green, green is mainly in the deck for the creatures, right? Two Argovian Pixies, three Urnum Jin, so not a playset, four Script Sprites, and of course to fix your mana you've got a Birds of Paradise. And then there are three creatures that may look green because it's a revised printing, but they're actually blue. Those are the Surrendip Afrit, so a 3-4 flyer, originally from Arabian Nights. Of course, very strong. I mean, three mana for a 3-4 it is bananas, especially in old school where creatures are actually quite underpowered, right? Um, then of course we see a, a regrowth in the deck and one Sylvan library. Interesting, right? Just one Sylvan. Sylvan can of course help you select and find the right cards. Maybe if you have some mana issues you can find them because remember it is kind of risky to play with so many colors in a format that allows for strip mines. Because of all the strip mines, it's easy for your opponent to kind of destroy your key pieces in your deck. But I guess what uh, Chow has done here is he has chosen to only play with cards that have only one color in their casting cost, right? So all the blue cards only have one blue in their casting cost, the red cards only one red, the green cards only one green, the white cards only one white, and he hasn't made an exception. And I kind of like that. For example, I think it's really good here that he plays with Power Sync over, for example, a Mana Drain. Because that two blue, that can be problematic if you play in a deck like this, even though he's got the Moxon as well to kind of back up his colors. So um, yeah, this is the deck. When I'm looking at it, I mean, it seems solid. He's got a lot of like more aggressive creatures that he can play out a little bit early, put some pressure on, then he can finish it off with direct damage. I mean, he's got a lot of bolts, he's got some fire bolts, it's integrates, chain lightning, psionic blasts. And then if things get out of hand, like a big creature comes on the board, which is usually hard to remove with um, with direct damage, for example, Urnum Jin eh, that he's playing with as well. That's what he's going to see uh, on the side of his opponent, Jason. Urnum Jin is usually hard to get rid of with only direct damage. But hey, man, then you've got two swords to plowshares. You've got some disenchants in there. So, I mean, it's, it's looking pretty solid. White can give you those solutions that the other colors just can't. Or they can, but just in a worse way. So I do understand this uh, modest inclusion of white here in the deck. Anyway, this is the deck, the deck of Chow. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Jason. And here we see the Urnum Geddon deck of Jason, and Jason's playing, I guess you could say, a more mainstream strategy, right? Urnum Geddon is a very famous strategy and used to be a very dominant deck. So what this deck wants to do, right, it wants to play your uh, your mana dorks out early, so you see four Birds of Paradise and three Elves of the Deep Shadow. Then you can tap those to kind of play out your Urnum Jins and your Sarah Angels early in the game, and then as soon as you've got your big creatures on board, you're gonna, you know, destroy all the lands with one of the Armageddons. We see three Armageddons here in the deck. Now the nice thing is that Jason also has added a little bit of black in here, and of course a very important white enchantment. So maybe start with the white enchantment. He's added land tax here to the strategy, which you actually see more often in Urnum Geddon, not always, but what Lantex does is it's an enchantment for one from Legends, and it reads, at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards, reveal them and put them into your hand and shuffle. And this is of course super powerful because not only can you take three land cards out of your deck, which is great after casting an Armageddon, right? But you can also kind of thin your library, take out all the lands. That means you're probably gonna find more like useful spells when you draw. I mean, 
you probably know the feeling, like you've got this land pocket and you're both top decking mode, you've got this land pocket. I mean, this is just frustrating. Land text can help you with that problem. Of course, I mean, your opponent has to have uh, uh, more lands than you. That's that's the only if, you know? So you just gotta wait till your opponent starts playing out lands. One of the problems, of course, in old school, and we also see that in the deck of Chow, or of course the Moxen. So it's good that he's playing with a full play set of Disenchant to kind of get rid of those Moxen. You could even consider playing with Crumble because Crumble is only one green, but then of course Crumble, you can only destroy artifacts, so it's not as flexible as Disenchant. So most people play or choose to play with Disenchant over Crumble, but I mean, Crumble could still be interesting. You know, I think it's I think it's important to kind of maybe, you know, keep a tally chart and see, okay, well, how often am I destroying an artifact with disenchant and how often am I destroying an enchantment with disenchant? And maybe it turns out you use disenchant a lot for enchantments, keep the disenchant in, but if it turns out, hey man, nine out of ten times I'm using the crumble, maybe try to crumble out, you know? Maybe, maybe you like it. I personally love crumbling Mistress Factories, which do we see Mistress Factories actually in this matchup? We do see one Mistress Factory on the side of Chow. Now, looking back at his deck list, we don't see any Mistress Factories in this list. So that's kind of nice, refreshing, actually, not to see a full play set of Mistress Factories on both sides of the board. Anyway, that's a different topic. Um, then he's combining his land text with Dark Heart of the Wood. So that's kind of a combo, right? Dark Heart of the Wood is a card from the dark, one green and one black, an enchantment that simply says, sacrifice a forest, you gain three life. So how does that work with land text? Well, if your opponent has more land than you, you simply sack some forest at his end step, gain some life. When it's your turn, you have less lands because you sacked some forest and you can activate the tax. It's really, really sweet, you know? So you're going to gain life and you get a land tax activation. It's like a win-win. It's, it's, it's really, really good if you can get that on the table. And of course, when you're playing black, you're playing with uh, Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist. That kind of makes sense. So we see those two cards in here as well. And I, I love the Elves of the Deep Shadow here because it can kind of help you cast those black spells. Then in the sideboard, I see one card I just want to mention because I love that card, Xenic Poltergeist. So Xenic Poltergeist is a card from Antiquities. You can tap it to turn target artifact alive. So how does that work? You tap it, you target uh, target non-artifact creature. So that could be your own, but also your opponents. And then it gets power toughness equal to the casting cost. Now remember, a mox has zero casting cost. So you can turn into a zero zero and it dies. So it's like a mox destroyer. It is kind of you know, difficult to cast with this deck because of the simple reason that it has two black and a casting cost. But I mean, yeah, I love the card and it's great to see it here in your sideboard, Jason. Um, okay, now that we've looked at the deck of Chow, we looked at the deck of Jason, we only have one more thing to do and that is go to the match. Game number one, here we go. So we've got Chow sitting on the left playing Urnum Chaos and we have Jason who I believe is on the play. He's playing Urnum Geddon with Lantex and Dark Heart of the Woods. So he splashed some black in there. Anyway, it looks like Chow is taking a mulligan here. A double mulligan. That is rough. Starting with only five cards. Ouch. Anyway, Jason opening here. Starting with an Elves of the Deep Shadow. A card from the Dark, a 1-1. One, one. You can tap it for one black. Then it deals one damage to you as well. But it can produce black mana. Passing the turn here to Chow. Who's got a Strip Mine and a Mox Emerald. Remember, we're playing Eternal Central Rules. So you can play with up to four Strip Mines. There's the pass. Let's see if Jason can find another land. There's a duel and tapping for mana here, it seems. Dropping to 19, there are the Argovian Pixies, a 2-1 creature from Antiquities. And it's a creature that cannot be blocked by artifacts and all damage dealt to it by artifacts is reduced to zero. So it's quite handy against the factories. There's an attack for three. And we see Chow dropping here to 17, taking the first points of damage. We see a Bolt there in hand. There's a Mishra's Factory, a Bolt, a Shatter, a Psionic Blast, and another land. Unfortunately for Chow, he cannot find the right mana yet. If he can find a red or a green source, that would be awesome for him. There's the attack with the 2-1 Pixies, so that means that Chow's gonna drop to 15 in a pass turn. There's another Factory taken from the top of the deck. Is he gonna attack here? And he is attacking, animating the factory, attacking for two. Jason tapping here. Does he have a disenchant? There's the disenchant. And that's, of course, the painful thing about the factory. You do, do not only lose a creature, you also lose a land. So it's almost like a tempo play against you, right? But fortunately for Chow, though, I mean, Jason is not really finding any land, so that's good news for him. 
There is of course some pressure. Attacking here with both. Interesting. Does that mean he has a swords to plowshares or is he bluffing? Because of course Chao exactly has that emerald and he can block the Elves of the Deep Shadow. So Elves of the Deep Shadow dies here and there's a Sol Ring. And there's a Sol Ring for Chao as well, dropping the land and the Sol Ring. But I mean, look at that hand. He's got Cyblast, Shatter, Bolt. Great cards right now, but he cannot find a red mana or a blue mana. That's his big problem. Passing to turn here is on 13, which is still pretty high. Let's see what Jason is going to do here. Attacking with the Pixie, so that means Chao is going to drop to 11. Animating here the factory. He cannot block it, though. It looks like he's blocking it. Okay, that is... Um, Interesting. He cannot block it, so he should take two points of damage. You drop to 11. Anyway, missing the damage, that can happen, of course. And Jason now taking his turn. Playing the Elves of the Deep Shadow. Oh, I believe that both players think that the Argovian Pixies can be blocked by the factory. But remember, you turn the Mishra's factory into a 2-2 assembly worker, which is an artifact. That's also why you can disenchant it, of course. Anyway, now he's got access to blue and to red with that volcanic island. And now it's looking really good for Chow, by the way. Because he's got Chain Lightning, he's got Bolt, and he's got Psionic Blast. He can take care of all the creatures on the board of Jason. And Jason just cannot find any mana. And now he's also lost the Soul Ring. So this is really bad. Gonna tap two, drop to 17. Are we gonna see a Demonic Tutor, perhaps? No, another Argovian Pixies attacking here. And it, look, it looks like he's gonna block. But he cannot block. So this is, I mean, this is a little... A little bit annoying. I wish somebody would watch the match and would say, guys, you can't block with it. Anyway, let's just continue. Maybe they'll find out later. Uh, he's playing a Thai guy here. Chain Lightning there on one of the Argovian Pixies. He can also play a Bolt on the other Argovian Pixies. And then, of course, attack with the Factory. Could also go for the Elves of Deep Shadow. I mean, Jason is really low on mana here. Attacking for two first, putting Jason on 15. And passing the turn. Looks like Jason has perhaps a disenchant in hand. There's hard to see, of course. But I think I spotted a disenchant, which would be really good news for him. He could attack now with the Pixies and wait for Jason to animate the factory. Gonna attack now. There we're gonna see the lightning bolt. I would seriously consider if I was Chow to now use the Psy Blast and take care of the Elves of Deep Shadow. There's an Urnum Jin. Wow, this is really good. I would personally really now really kill that Elves of Deep Shadow with the Psy Blast because you know then he only has one mana and you can just attack with your factory and your, your Urnum. Let's see what happens. So Jason really has bad luck this game. Just not finding any more lands. He's only found a forest and a savanna. Gonna tap. There's another Elves of Deep Shadow in a pass. Drawing a strip mine. Yep, stripping away his last land. That is very painful. And now, of course, he can attack it with the Urnum. I wonder... Okay, he's also gonna animate... The factory attacking here with both. You see a chum block here on the factory, it seems, and four points of damage. He's going to lose the Elves of Deep Shadow. Going to drop here to 13. And that's it. Jason is saying, you know what? I'm not going to survive this. So let's take a look at the Argovian Pixies again. Perhaps, uh, Chow and Jason, I missed something. You discussed something in your match. If that's the case, let me know. Uh, because as you can see on the card itself, um, it cannot be blocked by artifact creatures. And let's take a look at the Mishra's Factory when you turn it into an assembly worker. It's actually considered a 2-2 artifact creature. Anyway, uh, we're going to let these players sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So one game up for Chow. So he is on the draw. 
Looks like he's taking another mulligan again. He's gonna go down to earth. Now five cards in hand, no, six in hand. And he's got that Wheel of Fortune. So that's actually pretty good. Passing to Jason now, who's gonna start this off. Starting there with a Birds of Paradise with a beautiful signature there on it by Mark Poole. Beautiful card. Oh, we see Taiga into Bolt. Is he gonna do Bolt the Bird? Also has a Mox there, it seems, so he can uh, maybe deploy the Surrender Perfect next turn. Is he gonna do Taiga Bolt? There's the Mox Pearl. Let's see what he's gonna do here. Yep, he's gonna Bolt the Bird. I think that's a good decision here by Chow. You know, slow down your opponent and then hopefully next turn you can deploy your Surrender Perfect, the 3-4 Flyer. There's a strip mine though on the Taiga. That is really good. Oh, found a Volcanic from the top. Playing a strip first, I think that's a good strategy. The next turn play the Volcanic. Hopefully the strip can stick and he can play out the Surrender. Hopefully for Chow, of course. Let's see what Jason can do. Not finding any white sources here. Second forest. Now we're gonna see the Surrender Perfect and pass the turn. And then the question is, can Jason find white in the Swords to Plowshares? Finding a Swamp instead. Not great for him. Tapping three here. Ooh, there's a mind twist. This is interesting. If Chow can keep the Wheel of Fortune, that's what Chow is hoping on right now. Keep the wheel, keep the wheel, keep... Okay, wheel's lost. <laughs> I always like it when after like a mind twist, you play a balance or Wheel of Fortune or Ancestral Recall top deck or something. Anyway, the Wheel of Fortune is gone. It means he only has the channel left, which is very unfortunate. It was actually the one card that he could lose because he doesn't have any green sources. You know, that bolt also was quite handy. He's on 19 now, attacking Jason. Jason dropping to 17. And he's gonna strip the Swamp. Kinda makes sense, you're cutting off a color. Let's see what he can do. There's a Bayou, so the black is back. But the problem here for Jason is he doesn't find a white source and he really needs a Plains and a Swords to take care of that Surrender. Taking three more points, dropping to 14. I mean, he still has five turns. Which is a lot in Magic, but it's getting kind of tough. Okay, this Sylvan is good. This, this might help him to find what he needs passing the turn. Another damage for Chowie from his own Surrender. Dropping to 17, he can attack again, put Jason on 11. Finding an Urnum there from the top, but he doesn't have any green sources. Actually, really low on mana here. Attacking Jason, who's on 11. Passing the turn. Now we're going to see the uh, Sylvan activation. What can Jason find? Taking one card here makes sense. You don't want to take more damage. Remember, with Sylvan, you can take an extra card, but you got to pay four life, and you can take two extra cards max, but then you lose eight life. And he's just passing the turn. Oh, this is really bad for Jason. If he could just find something like a chump block or just something to stop that surrender. There's a terror. Oh, that came in from the sideboard. That is pretty good. I was so focused on the swords that I forgot that, of course, he could play Terror in the sideboard. So this is great news for, for Jason. I mean, he's still behind, but at least he's on 11, took care of the only threat on the side of Chow. And Chow has got serious mana issues. I mean, only you, he only has that Volcanic and that Mox Pearl. I think it's a good decision from Jason here not to take any extra cards. Okay, there's a Demonic. Might be tempted here to go for a White Source. I wonder what card that is. He found it pretty quickly. Is it just a land? Yep, it's a land. You got to do what you got to do. Finding a Savannah here. And playing a Disenchant there on the Mox Pearl. Yeah, this is really good. Just go on the Mana Denial. Which is a good thing. In this case, it's going to buy some time here for Jason. And look at that Strip Sprites. There's nothing in his hand that he can play out. If he can find at least a green source, he can start playing out his script sprites. It is risky, of course, playing with these four color decks in a, in a four strip format. Untapping, looking at the top three cards again. Jason again just taking the one. I mean, if he can find a white source, perhaps a Sarah or an Urnum, that's also good. Urnum Jin, 4 5 powerhouse from Arabian Nights. There's another volcanic. That's not what he wants. Now he can play out his Shatter, but there's no target. That is really unfortunate for Chow here. 
Now we could play the Armageddon, and I think that actually would be a good decision. Just play the Armageddon and, you know, keep attacking. Why not? On the other hand, I believe I also see a Swords there. He could just go for the Swords, and if he plays a creature, he can deal with it. But it must be tempting, right? Spirit Link. Oh, so perhaps that wasn't an Armageddon, but a Spirit Link there. And this Spirit Link is really good. Especially against Chao, because remember, Chao is playing with a lot of burn, you know, Psionic Blast, Lightning Bolts, Chain Lightning, Fireballs. So you really want to make sure you gain a lot of life, that you're out of direct damage reach. There's another Surrendip now in the hand of Chao and passing the turn. He's just not finding the lands he needs. And I mean, the Sylvan really came at the right time for Jason. And now he can attack, he can gain four more life. This is great for him. There he goes. I mean, Spirit Link is just, you know, a great card against these uh, these direct damage decks. Not that Chao just has a purely direct damage deck, but he does have a serious direct damage package. There's the Armageddon. Yeah, and I think this is a really good decision here from Jason. And a Forest and a Pass. I believe it's the end of the road here for Chao. Showing his hand. Yep, that's it. And I'm actually happy because it means we're going into game number three. Game number three, here we go, the big decider. So Chow here on the play after losing that second game. It's looking pretty good for him here. Mox Emerald and one of the dual lands he can play out on Ergovian Pixies. Let's see what he's gonna do. Volcanic, Mox Emerald, probably Argovian Pixies. There's the Pixies again, 2-1. Antiquities, this time on the side of Chow instead of on the side of Jason. Jason starting with the planes, and oh, there's a land text. Haven't seen the land text this entire match, but here in game three, it uh, shows it fa its face. And it's putting Chow in a bit of a difficult position. He has to decide, am I gonna play out a land or not? I actually think, I personally don't think you have to. I mean, you're ahead on board anyway. You can use the Emerald exactly to play your 1-1 flyer. That's, uh, that's exactly what he does to script sprites and passing the turn. I think this is a very good decision. Let's see what Jason can do here, playing out a Bayou and a Birds of Paradise. Are we gonna see a Bolt the Bird? Yes, Bolt the Bird. So the bird's gone. Passing the turn here and I wonder what Chow is gonna do here, finding a Birds of Paradise of his own. I believe he only plays one in the deck, but he's found the one copy. So a little bit in the tank here. One of the, exactly, he could strip here to Bayou I think that's a good decision, and he still has the Mox Emerald to play out the birds. That's what he does now, yeah, perfect. Very well played, and it's looking pretty grim here for Jason. I mean, he's still on 15, he's not that low, but there is pressure. There's another Birds of Paradise, and a pass. Haven't seen a single Dark Heart of the Wood, by the way, from Jason here in the matches. There's a Taiga, could attack here for three again. Yep, turning everything sideways. Jason dropping to 12. There's a pass. And here we can see Jason not really, you know, having anything, or it, he isn't really able to do anything with Lantex. That's what, that's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, we see an Urnum Jin here on the board from Jason. Put some pressure on. Ooh, this is quite nice, this Psionic Blast. He's got four mana. Five mana. He could consider attacking. He could also wait for one of his creatures to gain Forest Walk. He's probably going to get Forest Walk to the Birds of Paradise. I mean, he can attack. He can combine it. Oh, he's going to put four damage on the Psionic Blast first and then one damage with the Fireball. Okay, that's possible as well. Keeping the pressure on. Does mean he does mean it's a two for one, so his hand's empty at the moment. Attacking Jason, dropping to nine. There is another Urnum though. And uh, Jason, you're choosing for the very nice altar. It looks beautiful. And Chow, you're in top decking mode. Can of course still attack with the script sprites because it's gonna fly over the Urnum. What has he found here? Oh, another flyer. That is really good. A surrender of Freet. That is a problem here because that means four more damage next turn. And look at the life total of Jason. He's already on eight. It's looking really bad now. Jason needs an answer for that surrender. Of course, he can chum block one more turn with the birds. 
I mean, what he needs are just the terrors. Well, yeah, because he's got the burst for black source, or he needs uh, swords to plowshares. Both cards can help him here. I mean, he's, he's kind of in the tank here. Does he want to attack with the Urnum? If he does, Chow can double block. And Jason will only be able to kill the Surrender for free. But yeah, I think I would attack nonetheless, because then you kill the Surrender. There's a chump block. Interesting moment to chump block since he's still he's still on 18. I think I wouldn't even have chump blocked. I think I would have just taken the damage. He's gonna drop to 17. He can attack for four in the air. Can put Jason on four. Of course, Jason can then chump with the bird, so he only takes one damage. He would go down to seven. This is a very close game, actually, despite the fact that Jason's on eight and Chow's still on 17. I mean, the thing with the Serenip is, it's really a creature made for attacking. You want to attack with it? Exactly. I would have done the same. I would have just attacked with both. And I think... This is tough here for Jason, because he's got a Sarah Angel in hand, it seems. So if he can just draw one more mana... He actually has enough mana to play the Sarah Angel next turn, so he could take four points of damage. But then if Chow has a Psionic Blast in hand, he's dead. So this is tough. He is taking the risk here. Going to four. Are we going to see a Psionic Blast? No, we're not past the turn. But this is, of course, super risky because he's got to use the Elso Deep Shadow. That would put him on two, uh, sorry, three life into Bolt range. Finding a City of Brass. This is really tough. The thing is, if he taps the Elves of Deep Shadow and all his land to cast the Sarah Angel, he takes two damage, drops to two, but at least he keeps the Birds of Paradise as a blocker. If he plays, if he uses the Birds to cast the Sarah, he only takes one damage, goes to three, but he loses, of course, the Birds as a chump blocker. So that's kind of the choice that he has to make. Tapping here, playing the Sarah Angel, 4-4 four, four Flyer, of course, a great blocker here. And this is a moment where I think if you're Jason, you're really hoping to find that Spirit Link again that he found in game number two. Because with the Spirit Link on the Sarah, for example, you know, that could kind of get him ahead on life. There's the attack here. Are we going to see a chum block here or just take the damage? Chow taking the damage, dropping to 13. And I think that's sensible, Chow. I would have done the same. 13 is still pretty high. Going to drop to 12 now. The problem, of course, is that Sarah Angel attacking with both full pressure, blocking the Surrender. That means he's going to drop to two. There's a Bolt. Yep. Actually, he was already in Bolt range, and that's it. Bolt deciding another game yet again. And you can see Jason there pointing at the City of Brass saying, I had no choice. I had to go to three. I think it wouldn't have mattered even if it would have gone to two already and then, you know, kept the uh, Birds of Paradise as a chum blocker. It wouldn't have saved him because he would have been on three. And you know against these decks, as soon as you're on three, you're walking on thin ice, you're playing with borrowed time. But still, Jason, you got very, very close. I would like to thank both players, Chow and Jason. Thank you very much for showing your skills here on the channel and allowing Flying Anger Pig to record your match. Actually, a shout out to you. Flying Anger Pick, aka Kevan, uh, for uh, for sending me these matches, man. It's been great fun to show uh, three matches from this, what seems to be an amazing tournament, the Sin City Open 2023. It looks like you guys have had a lot of fun there in Las Vegas, Nevada. And thank you for sharing it here on my channel so that I can show it to everybody out there. So if you're in the States and you're playing old school, just search Sin City Fallen Angels and you'll find their old school play group on Instagram and probably... Maybe somewhere on Facebook. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, Google, use, use your internet skills and you can probably find them. Thank you very much, guys, for uh, showing the matches here. And before you go, I'd like to ask you to, if you're not a subscri subscriber yet, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And also, if you're not um, a patron yet, please consider becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks to find out how you can become a patron of the show. It already starts with $1 a month and you're really helping me as a content creator to continue making these videos for you. So if you enjoy what I do, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks. And talking about the patrons, let's take a look at our end scroll with our amazing Mundaba, fantastic channel members and patrons. Here we go. What shall we do with the drunk and say the what shall we do with the drunk and say the Oh, baby.
Somber Kazik.